Hey folks, Rob Eger here with a little film analysis video on The Elephant Man. Now, The Elephant Man, despite being directed by David Lynch, was always a film that I thought of as just having a straight narrative. It's very easy to follow what's happening in the film. Uh, the film isn't complex. Um, it, there's not all kinds of weird layers to figure out like there is with a movie like, say, Lynch's Mulholland Drive or Lost Highway or A Race Ahead or Inland Empire. This movie appears to be very straightforward. Uh, and therefore, whenever anybody mentions the name David Lynch, I always think of those movies as really bizarre movies that require a lot of conscious effort to try and figure out. And I tend not to think of The Elephant Man. In fact, I always just thought of both The Elephant Man and Dune as being uh, movies that David Lynch was simply a hired director and he was just basically doing it for the money and to progress his career in Hollywood after he'd made his first movie, Eraserhead. But looking at the Elephant Man in detail recently, I'm glad to report that I was very wrong in these assumptions. Now, the initial script for the Elephant Man was written before David Lynch got involved in the project, but once he was on board, he brought in his own ideas. And it's not always easy to figure out which new elements he brought to the table, but one aspect is the industrial imagery and sound, and this, I am quite convinced, were Lynch's ideas. Prior to Elephant Man, Lynch had only made one feature film, the ultra-low budget but ultra-high concept, Eraserhead. Now, that film was in black and white, just like the Elephant Man, and it had a lot of symbolic industrial imagery. Grinding machinery was used to symbolise things like the human reproductive mechanism, and so on. The industrial imagery of the Elephant Man is very similar to that of Eraserhead, it's just not used as often. But I think it serves multiple symbolic functions in this film. The opening dream sequence, I believe, is a dream being had by Merrick himself because it's similar to a dream sequence midway through the movie, and that second dream starts with the camera zooming into the eye socket of Merrick's hood. In the first dream, industrial sounds are heard as Merrick's mother is apparently injured by an elephant, but I think this is actually a metaphor for her getting pregnant. The script says that a heartbeat is heard, but in the film, the heartbeat is replaced by an industrial beat. There's the machine organic metaphor, just like in Eraserhead. The script also says, quote, Trunk slides over mother's face and breasts and stomach, leaving a moist trail, end quote. Note the body parts there and their sequence in relation to sex, which typically starts with the face for kissing and then moves into foreplay over the breasts and then to penetration further down, uh, with eventually a moist trail from the phallus, symbolised by the elephant trunk here, I believe. Now you may think, oh come on, that's just like crazy interpretation, but come on, you try and make sense of this. This isn't a literal scene, this is a dream sequence, and therefore it's symbolic. And David Lynch has packed lots of his movies with dream sequences, and half the time he doesn't even tell you which scenes are and aren't dreams. In this one, at least we do know it's a dream. And so there's undoubtedly symbolism going on here. Now, Eraserhead began with a very similar sequence involving an egg symbolising planet, and it had industrial levers being pulled to release sperm and so on. Eraserhead is all about parenting and the machinery of the reproduction cycle and all that kind of stuff. So I think the dream at the start of The Elephant Man has double meaning. It's Merrick's own subconscious anxieties about his freak show stage name, The Elephant Man, and I think it represents a genetic mutation accident in Merrick's conception. The mother's own screaming looks like she's making elephant noises, and the visual distortion of her face gives her a deformed appearance, like Merrick himself maybe. And the dream ends with an emerging cloud of smoke and the sound of a baby crying. Merrick's birth. The cloud is interesting here. I wonder if that represents the deformed growth of Merrick's head. Who knows, this is David Lynch. From this dream sequence, we cut to the, the actual straight narrative of the film, so to speak, uh, which starts with belching flames of a freak show circus. Industrial flames are an important and repeating visual element in this film. Another part of the industrial symbolism is the idea of Merrick being trapped in a social and psychological cage, isolated. Some freaks are seen behind bars in the opening carnival scenes. 
Uh, Treves doesn't get to see the Elephant Man yet, but the notion of deformed people trapped in the cage of a travelling circus lifestyle has been established here. From this opening carnival, we cut to a blazing fire again, and pan out to Dr. Treves performing surgery on a man who's been injured in a machine accident. Abominable things, these machines. You can't reason with them. Remember that Merrick's own birth was presented as an accident with an industrial heartbeat heard over the sequence. And note the blazing flames above the operating table too. It's another example of the consistent use of flames in this film. Dr. Treves, incidentally, will later perform a sort of psychological and social surgery on the Elephant Man himself as the story progresses. After this scene, Treves is shown crossing a street, but a hollow-sounding noise is heard, uh, which sounds like either an industrial wind or the hiss of hot pipes. This kind of hollow ambience is present lots of times in the movie, but I won't go over all the examples here. On his way to get a private viewing of Merrick, this scene is full of industrial sight and sound. Treves passes a machine-like musical organ, and there's lots of flames here, smoke and machinery, and then more machinery with workmen pounding away. By the way, the choice to shoot in black and white also gives the impression of the film's setting being like a machine, though it may also have been done to avoid the awkwardness of having to make the Elephant Man's makeup look flesh-coloured. Overall, the industrial machinery elements along with the cold black brick walls seem to depict the harsh nature of Merrick's world, the indifference of a society built upon industrial assembly. This in turn crosses over into the emotionally hostile landscape that Merrick lives in, for example, the mechanisms of the clock tower tormenting him in the isolation ward. The ongoing clock mechanisms are also subliminally heard like a beating heart in several scenes. We bring you another breakfast, I'm sure you must be very hungry. And there's lots more of this industrial imagery and sound in the film, the hissing gas pipes of the hospital, the loud echoes in the hospital halls. Downstairs with me and I'll explain the situation. Don't! The industrial cage metaphors occur several times. Taken into the hospital, Merrick has put in the isolation ward, which has a locked cage entrance. He is literally put in a cage by the uh, freak show manager, Bites, in another scene. And when he's trying to make his way back to the hospital, we hear the harsh industrial sights and sounds of a steamship and then a steam train. And it's cloudy with nasty rainy weather in which he is getting drenched rather than stand in the dry where passengers are likely to harass him. Arriving at a London train station, the first shot is of the cage-like roof structure above. And then when he gets chased and tries to escape through a toilet, he comes up against another set of bars. He's caged in again. So it's like Merrick is permanently caged or trapped in a cold social machine wherever he goes. In fact, we could say that the industrial world that Merrick inhabits is as ugly and deformed as he is. And there's not much nature here. The notion of everyday people being cogs of the social machine, this idea pops up here and there. The nasty night porter, he lights a cigar here, and the flash of his lighter prompts a cut to a black gas pipe spewing out flames. That composition is such a specific parallel, and it's typical of Lynch's surrealist filmmaking techniques. When the night porter brings a woman in who screams at sight or upon seeing Merrick, we cut straight to the ugly sight of chimneys spewing out black smoke. Is that a symbol of growing rage and frustration within Merrick about how he's being treated? I don't know. Again, it's David Lynch. When a crowd of drunken idiots are on their way to torment Merrick, they're seen in parallel with smoke belching machinery. Listen to the soundscape too. Then when Treves goes to confront the porter after Merrick goes missing, the porter is peddling a big flame oven. 
So these people are cogs in a big, uncaring, unempathic social machine, and they treat Merrick like he's a broken or deformed cog that doesn't serve the overall machine purpose. Once Merrick is taken back onto the Freak Roadshow across Europe, the camera pans across various stages here, and shortly before we reach Merrick's stage, a lion-faced man is seen in a cage. The Lion Man is another fictional human-animal hybrid, and this time we have thunder and lightning and rain adding to the harsh aesthetics. And this punctuates Merrick's fall. Note as well that the Lion Man physically leads the way at night during the group mission to free Merrick and send him back to England. One particular moment of industrial sight and sound that I like is when Merrick is chased through the train station. As his running picks up speed, we see the smoke of a steam engine and we hear the slowly increasing speed of a train engine along with the panic sound of its siren. It very much matches with his increasing attempt to run and it's a really effective way to add tension to the scene. Merrick's second dream sequence has a variation on these industrial elements, panning from his sleeping head and into the eye sockets of his hood, we're entering his mind, and the first thing we see is industrial pipes, and his snoring becomes the groans of the pipes. <laughs> So, do these pipes represent the internal mechanisms of his mind and body, or is it just aesthetics regarding how he feels? His nightmare then ends with the emotional turmoil of swirling smoke or clouds, I'm not sure which. All this industrial imagery used in different symbolic ways is powerful stuff, but in the film's more pleasant moments when Merrick is having experiences that at last have an element of happiness to them, the filmmakers switch from the dark, rigid industrial metaphors to softer, brighter, and more pleasant images and sounds. After Merrick finally breaks his utter silence and has a conversation that lets Dr. Treves and the hospital warden know that he has a normal functioning mind, we switch straight from this to soft, pleasant opera music. No one could possibly imagine it. I don't believe any of us can. At last, a break from the relentless machinery metaphors. The soft white curved furnishings of Treves' home when Merrick gets to visit there, this is another break with the machine imagery. Merrick's visit to the theatre also trades in the industrial imagery for shimmering sparkles and jolly music. And in his third and final dream sequence on the night of his death at the end of the film, at last he's having a dream that is free of industrial images. I like all this stuff because while The Elephant Man can be watched and perceived as a simple, straight narrative movie, all of these sophisticated sights and sounds play on us, drawing us into the emotional world of Merrick in what I consider to be a compensation for the fact that we can't really see emotional expressions on his severely deformed face. Now there's tons more to say about The Elephant Man and I've just written a 34 page analysis of it which I'm preparing into a much larger video. So this is a little sample for you guys here. Hope you enjoyed it. In the meantime, if you want to get a batch of new content off me quickly, then go to my website on the film analysis page which is linked in the video description below. There I have got a discount set available this week which is all of my material on Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Uh, all of my offline material is available in one set at 70% off. So go and grab that. And again, that's digital download, so you can get them very quickly once you've ordered. It's a 205-page article plus about two and a half hours worth of videos all just on that one movie. So go and check that out. Grab a copy while it's available this week. You've been listening to Rob Ager. Bye for now, folks.